you can start now auzu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem bismillahir rahmanir rahim innal hamdalillah nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nastaghfiruhu wa na'udhu bihi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyi'ati a'malina may yahdihillahu fala mudilla lahu wa may yudlil fala hadiya lahu wa nashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa tahu la sharika lahu wa nashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu the brothers and sisters inshallah will continue the series on islamic jurisprudence its history evolution and the major jurists along with their madhahib last week we started the series and today will be the second part of it inshallah so in the first lecture we talked about the very beginning of the islamic fiqh and its two divine sources we also talked about uh, how the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam sometimes used this ijtihad he also told the sahaba so when he left this world to meet with his real creator he had left behind people who were very well trained in islamic jurisprudence they knew the quran they knew the sunna they knew the ahadith and they knew the principles based upon which they could provide solutions to the emerging problems of the muslim community now we have to understand that not every sahabi radiyallahu ta'ala anhu radiyallahu ta'ala anha was a jurist but there were some famous jurists among the companions who gave many juristic verdicts there was a methodology which we will discuss there was consensus on many issues and obviously based upon their understanding sometimes they gave different fatwa as well the most prominent among these companions who were considered to be the faqaha or jurists were umar radiyallahu ta'ala no ali radiyallahu ta'ala no abdullah ibn mas'ud radiyallahu ta'ala an aisha radiyallahu ta'ala na they had been sabit abdullah ibn abbas and abdullah bin umar radiyallahu ta'ala anhum ajmain <coughs> there were also companions who were faqaha but they did not give too many fatwa and their names include abu bakr siddiq umm salama anas abu huraira uthman abdullah ibn zubair salman farsi saad ibn waqas jabir bin abdullah abdullah bin amr muad ibn jabal abu said al khudri talha zubair ibn al awwam abdur rahman ibn auf imran ibn husain abu bakra ubada bin samit and amir muawiya ridwanullah alayhi majmain so they were also very learned people they knew the quran they knew the sunna they had their intellect and they also gave juristic verdicts when they were approached by people but they were, the number of their verdicts is less than the verdicts of the other sahaba that we saw now what was the methodology of the companions obviously they followed the holy quran and the sunna in matters which were not directly dealt with in the quran or the sunna they used ij the ijma or consensus they also looked at the precedent and analogical reasoning which is called qiyas they kept the public interest or maslahatun nas in their view and there was also another <coughs> juristic strategy which is called istihsan which means preference for a particular judgment over other possibilities based upon discretion so obviously the khulafa rashidun ridwanullah alai majmain were not only the political heads of the state they were also religious heads of the state and if there were more than one possibilities on a given issue they preferred one over the other based upon their own discretion based upon the strength of the opinion based upon public interest and i'll give some examples so the hadith comes from uh, uh, imam zohri who has narrated a lot of hadith he was a tabi abu tabi as well he said that uh, a grandmother came with the mother and the son of her son after the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to abu bakr siddiq radiyallahu ta'ala and she said that my grandson either the son of her daughter or the son of her son had passed away and he said wa qad ukhbirtu anna li haqqan i have been told that i have a right in inheritance of my grandchild now abu bakr siddiq radiyallahu ta'ala no did not give an answer in yes or no he simply said that ma ajitu laki fi kitab illa min haqq i do not find in the book of allah that there is a right for you which means for the grandmother 
And he said, And I haven't heard anything from the Prophet about your right, that is the right of the grandmother in inheriting from the property of her grandchild. So he said, I will ask the people. Now you will be amazed that Abu Bakr Siddiq who had been a Muslim forever, you know, he was the first adult male who became a Muslim. He testified to the uh, Isra and Miraj of the Prophet ﷺ. He was with the Prophet ﷺ during his migration, during all the battles. He's the Khalifa, he's the head of the state, very learned man, highly intellectual. He could have given a decision, but he said no. Because I don't find it in the book of Allah and I don't find it in the Sunnah of the Prophet. ﷺ. So I will ask the people. This is how the Islamic khalif Khilafat worked. Wa amruhum shura bainahum. Their mutual affairs were decided by their mutual consensus. So now he asked the people, and Mughara bin Shoba, but the Allah Ta'ala said that an Nabi that the Prophet had decided in another matter that he gave one sixth of the inheritance to the grandmother. Now Abu Bakr Siddiq did not deny what he said, but he wanted somebody else to be a witness because obviously you need two witnesses in this situation. So he said, who will testify with you? Then Muhammad bin Muslima said that I am. The, so he said Muhammad bin Muslima. So Muhammad bin Muslima was asked and he also witnessed Fa'ata Sudus. Then Abu Bakr Sadiq gave the grandmother one sixth of the inheritance. Now you may ask a question that what if there was no one else to support the opinion of Mughira bin Shoba? And I think it's an open-ended question whether they would have accepted his uh, hadith Maybe they would have asked him to take an oath on the book of Allah that they were telling the truth and they may have accepted the uh, opinion. You know, there are certain situations where there is only one witness, there is no other witness. And if that solitary witness is a reliable witness, you can accept his shahada. For example, uh, it was, I think, uh, I believe it was about the Ramadan or Eid that a person, the, the Prophet and his Sahaba in Medina did not see the moon but then a person came from the outskirts and he said i saw it and although he was the only witness the prophet wasalam, accepted his shahada now some other examples and this is from fatul bari which is the shar of sahi bukhari by hafiz ibn hajar al askalani about the congregational taraviyah prayers now we have to understand that during the time of the prophet wasalam, according to hadith he came out only during three nights of Ramadan, and he led people in congregation in the Taraviyah prayers. But otherwise, he would do it at home. And there was a reason that he did not want it to become a fard. So Hafiz ibn Hajar mentioned that inna salat al tarawi fil jama wajiba al al kifaya. The salat al tarawi in congregation is a fard kifaya. It's wajib kifaya. It's not mandatory that everybody should do that. But in a given Muslim community, some people have to offer it in a masjid. And that will suffice for the entire community. And it says Ibn Battal has mentioned that Qiyamur Ramadan Sunnah. لِأَنَّ أُمَرَ إِنَّمَا أَخَذَهُ مِنْ فَعْلِ النَّبِيِّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ وَإِنَّمَا تَرَكَهُ النَّبِيِّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ خَشْيَةَ الْإِفْتَرَاءِ That the the Qiyam of Ramadan, which means the Taraweeh prayer, are Sunnah. They are not wajib according to him. And he said the Umar رضي الله تعالى عنه made this decision. On the basis of the action of the Prophet. So, this was not a bidah that Umar initiated, as some people would say. He actually took the evidence from the action of the Prophet, who did lead, lead the prayer people in prayers on three nights. And he mentioned that the Prophet did not do it on a consistent basis because he was afraid that this will become mandatory, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make it mandatory. And because after the Prophet, there was no possibility. That he would come, Umar established a good sunnah. Now it is also mentioned that Anna Umara Jama Anasa ala Ubay bin Kab, Fakana Yusalli bin Rijal, Wakana Tami Maddari Yusalli, Kana Tami Maddari Yusalli bin Nisa. Now this is an important part that, and the explanation, the uh, further details are that Umar saw the people offering the Taraweeh prayers uh, in, in isolation individually. So he said that won't it be a good thing that if I gather them all behind one Imam, one Qari. So he appointed Ubay bin Kaab, who was actually 
one of the best Qari, if not the best Qari of the Quran at that time. So he would be leading the people in Taraviyah and Tamim Dari would be leading the people, would be leading the women in Tarawi. So again, this is an evidence from the Sunnah of the Umar, uh, the Abar Khalafa. And it has been going on since the time of Sahaba. There is an Ijma on Sahaba. Women can also offer Taraviya prayer in Jama behind an Imam. A another incident happened during the time of Umar radiallahu ta'ala no, that the Muslim empire was expanding and more and more lands were coming under the Islamic possession. And the question was, how should these lands be distributed? Should they be given to the Mujahideen? Should the government take control of it? What should they do? So Umar radiallahu ta'ala no, again, he was the second Khalifa. He could have used his own judgment. But no, he took advice from the companions of the Holy Prophet Again, wa amruhum shura bainahum. So he asked them regarding the distribution and the use of the conquered land since he was unsure. Now, after consultation, the decision was reached that the land should remain with the owners since they possess the necessary skill for its future cultivation. And then they will give some portion of it to the Islamic government. So again, we have to see that in matters which were not to be found in the Quran and Sunnah addressed directly, the Sahaba Ridwan including the Khalifa, would solve this issue by mutual consensus, by mutual advice. And if somebody was able to come up with a hadith, then they will accept it. And there are many other <coughs> examples, but I will give only some. One is the compilation from the Holy Quran in the form of the Mus'haf. Abu Bakr Siddiq no, had some reservation. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened his heart and the heart of Umar no, and the other Sahaba. The uh, three divorces in one sitting, it was uh, done by Umar radiallahu no. Temporary suspension of the punishment for stealing because it was a time of starvation. Suspending the distribution of zakat to non-Muslims. These were all the decisions, you can call them the discretionary decisions of the Khalafa based upon mutual consultation. So again, Islamic Sharia is not in a state of uh, suspension. It is not Jamid. It is very much active. It is always evolving based upon the principles given in the Quran and the Sunnah. But if a matter has been clearly decided in the Quran and the Sunnah, then obviously we cannot deviate. Now, fiqh is actually problem, problem solving. So, methodology of the of our Khalifa Rashidun Ridwanullah Alayhi Majmain, when faced with the new problem, was number one, they will search in the Holy Quran. Then they will look at the Sunnah of the Prophet. They will call for consultation with knowledgeable companions to reach a consensus. But there's a difference between consensus and democracy. In democracy, every vote counts. Whereas in consensus, people who have the required specialized knowledge, they are consulted and their opinions are given more weight because it is based upon their knowledge. So in fact, in fact, when we have a consensus in medical treatment of any disease, it is done not through a democratic process of taking a vote from every physician. These matters are decided by opinion leaders who have the required knowledge, experience, expertise, who have done a lot of research, who know all the literature, who know all the studies, and it's their opinion that counts. And then they reach a consensus. Next is that they would adopt majority opinion if no consensus was reached. And lastly, they would the Khalifa will use his own ijtihad or even a Sahabi will use his own ijtihad. If their differences were so great that no overwhelming majority opinion could be determined. So what was the approach of the individual companions of the Prophet Now we have to understand that as the Islamic State was expanding, the Khalifa were actually sending the Sahaba to different centers of uh, Islam, include uh, Mecca, Medina, Basra, Hufa, Syria, Iraq, they were going to every part of the Islamic land and these Sahaba had the knowledge of the Quran and they had learned from the Prophet So when they were faced with the problem, obviously there was no email in that time, there was no iMessage. They had to use their own judgment. They, used, they had to use their own knowledge to solve those problems. Now, not every companion was a jurist. So people were not going to any Sahabi just like that. They usually would go to a Sahabi who had the required knowledge. Individual companions responded to the questions asked to them, but they would make it clear that their deductions were not necessarily as Allah intended. 
this is a very important thing. And one example is that Abdullah bin Masood radiallahu ta'ala, no, who was also known as one of the fuqaha among the Sahaba. And it is his fiqh which eventually became solidified in the Madhav Hanafi. So he gave a verdict about a woman who was married, but her mahr was not fixed. And the question was, how much mahr should she take? So he gave an opinion and then he said, I'm giving my opinion about her. If it is correct, then it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if it is incorrect, then it is from me and Shaitan. So that was his approach. Now, the Sahaba were not fixated on their own opinion. They would drop, drop their opinion when they were informed of an authentic hadith. So they will not argue against a hadith. And the example is the issue of the burial of the Holy Prophet ﷺ. When he passed away, he had not left behind any will. and There was nothing in the Quran how he should be buried. So here, some people had a different opinion. That some said they should take him to Baqi. But eventually, it was decided based upon a hadith that Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu no mentioned that the Ambiya alayhi salatu wasalam are buried at the place where they pass away. So they decided to bury the Prophet sallam, in the hujra of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. And nobody argued at that time. Now, if the companions differed on an issue, they would not force their opinion on each other. This is something very important. Neither would they say that the other Sahabi was wrong because they were all making ijtihad and they were equally liable to make mistake or to reach the correct decision. There was no factionalism among the Sahaba at that time and there were no rigid schools of thought at that time. Now, the transition occurs from the Caliphate to monarchy. The Khilafat was ended with the assassination of Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu and it was replaced by monarchy. Muawiyah radiallahu ta'ala anhu became the first head of the Umavi Umayyah empire. The government system was altered from selection on the basis of merit to hereditary succession when Muawiyah radiallahu ta'ala anhu appointed his son Yazid as his successor. The evolving leaders legal system had to adopt to the social transformation from a nomadic lifestyle to a settled and urban one. And this is a very important sociological point of view that when there is a change from a rural style of living, a nomadic style of living where people are always on the move to an urban situation or an urban scenario where population settles down, then newer issues can come up. And how does the legal system evolves itself and adapts itself to their changing needs is an important sign of wisdom and growth in a community. There was also cultural mixing, mixing due to expansion of the Islamic State. Now we have to understand that Islam did not abolish everything that was pre-Islamic. It only changed those things which were against the basic tenets of Islam. So culture was not negated by Islam so long as it was not in contradiction to Sharia. Now, there were different uh, viewpoints as well. And different scholars, both Muslims, non-Muslims, who have a steady Islamic uh, legal system, have given different opinions. One was that the Islamic fiqh continued to evolve as a historical phenomenon, closely li linked to social progress, but is still based upon the Quran, the Hadith, consensus, and ijtihad. And this has actually continued till this day. That these are the four pillars of the Islamic Sharia, the Islamic uh, jurisprudence. Our four sources are the divine, two divine sources, the Quran and the Hadith. And then come the in consensus, consensus and ishtihad. And actually the consensus of Sahaba Ridwanullah Ta'ala Alayhi Majmain is given preference of over any other consensus. And it will be considered to be a divine source of law because the Sahaba Ridwanullah Alayhi Majmain were chosen by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to be the companions of the Prophet They were trained and taught by him. Another view is that the newly developed legal system was divorced from historical considerations. It was influenced by local practices, by the ideology of local scholars and the assimilation of foreign elements. Now, this is not my opinion. I'm simply giving you an academic presentation that there are different viewpoints on how the Islamic fit evolved over a period of time, especially in the first 200 years. It is also mentioned that the Islamic fiqh is the end product of two centuries of community experience. Now we can now safely say that it's the end product of 14 
centuries of the community experience because Islamic fit is not fixed. Obviously, the principles are fixed in the Quran and the Hadith. The decisions given by the by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Quran, the decisions given by the Prophet are still valid and they are first and foremost for us to follow. But any new situation that comes up it can be resolved on the basis of the four major sources, the Quran, the Hadith, the Ijma of Sahaba and earlier scholars, and the Ijtihad. And it becomes part and parcel of the Islamic Sharia. The Islamic fiqh is not just limited to only the first two centuries, although those two were the foundational sources and the golden period of Islamic fiqh. The ongoing evolution started during the lifetime of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu and it has still continued. The Islamic legal theory recognized a variety of sources and methods from which law can be derived, including local customs. So the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi also followed the existing pre-Islamic Arabic practices, except those that were rejected by the Holy Quran. And we can say that science, medical, prog medical knowledge, financial uh, changes, they can all be used when dealing with the, the contemporary issues or they are part of the al fiqh al -Muhasir. Then came the period of the followers, which was the period of challenges. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has actually praised the followers of the Sahaba. The people who followed the Muhajirin and the Ansar, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is happy with them. So we give due credibility and respect to the consensus of the Tabi'in as well because they were the students of Sahaba. Many of them were living in Makkah and Medina. And Medina was the first Islamic state. Now we'll talk about the living Sunnah, or the living tradition, which has its own importance in the Islamic fit, especially in the Maliki fit. The end of the Caliphate was the beginning of the Umayyad dynasty, as I mentioned. During that period of time, the political environment became quite unstable. There was expansion of the Islamic status, Islamic state, with the integration of uh, other cultures and customs. The consensus of Sahaba, unfortunately, gave way to the Khalaf. Khalaf means ikhtilaf or the difference of opinion. Now, as I mentioned earlier, that during the time of the companions, if they disagreed with each other, then the majority opinion would be adopted and people will not fight. There was no factionalism. It's not that they will establish their own school of thought and isolate themselves from the community. That was not the case at the time of the Sahaba Ridwanullah Alayhi Mashmain. And unfortunately, fabrication of Ahadis also started during that period of time, which according to some scholars was to give support to the decisions made in one Islamic center. And again, this is a topic of very academic research, and I don't think that I'm qualified to talk about it in such, especially in such a short period of time. Many centers of Islamic learning then uh, were established. Islam did not exist only in Mecca and Medina. It reached as far as Egypt and Syria in the first 200 years. Several centers of Islamic learning were established. The first one was Kufa, which was the cantonment established by Umar radiallahu no. And he sent Abdullah bin Masood radiallahu ta'ala no, to teach people over there. And then Ali radiallahu ta'ala no, chose Kufa to be his uh, capital, the capital of the Islamic State. So obviously many Sahaba Ridwanullah alayhi majmain settled down over them. Basra, Syria, Egypt, they all became very important centers of Islamic learning. And Sahaba were scattered all over the place. In fact, it is mentioned that when Imam Malik uh, completed his book Mawatta, Imam Malik, Khalifa, I think it was uh, Abu Mansur Jafar. He told him that, why don't we make your book as the law of the land, like the constitution? And Imam Malik rejected this idea. He said, no, there are many centers of Islamic learning. And every center has the Sahaba Ridwanullah alayhi Majmain, who have learned from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So how can I make my book to be the Islamic law for everybody? Everybody has the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So every center had the companions uh, whose connection with the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam maintained the continuity of the Islamic Sharia. This is a very, very important point because Joseph Sect uh, was, I think, a Polish uh, Orientalist, wrote a book on Muhammadan jurisprudence in which he kind of said that the Islamic legal system evolved mainly because of the local customs and people fabricated the hadith just to support their own viewpoint. And his theory was challenged and Mustafa Al-Azmi did his PhD from Cambridge University 
on Joseph Sachs, Mohammedan, Jur uh, Mohammedan jurisprudence. So this is a book that I, if you want to read, you should read it. Now, what were the sources of influence on the Islamic law as it was evolving? And it still continues to evolve, but we are talking about the first generations of Islam. So there were political events which affected the dogma as well. And it gave rise to several different theological groups and sects. I'm not going into their detail. Local culture and habits, many of them were adopted. Those that were contrary to the Quran and Sunnah were rejected. There was also a geographic evolution which were generated by contrasting individual situations emerging with time in various parts of the Islamic world. And this is a relevant point, very, very relevant to us because many Muslims have migrated to non-Islamic uh, world, no, non-Islamic non countries, and they face certain issues which are very much related to their geographical evolution. And it's important that we seek fatwa when we are in America and seeking, see, uh, facing a particular situation, that we seek fatwa not from the scholars at home who have never lived in that environment, in the geographical uh, location, but to the scholars who are actually living at this time in these lands and they know the, rea the reality on the ground. During the time of the Umayyah Khilafat, the Islamic jurisprudence evolved into two, or I, I'm not going to use the word split into, but I would say that it evolved into two major schools of thought. One you can call Ahlul Rivaya, whose main reliance was on the text. That will be the text of the Quran and the Hadith and the fatawa given by the consensus of the Sahaba. But then there were other scholars who were called Ahlul Rai, who also relied upon individual reasoning. Now we cannot say that these scholars put their opinion before Quran and Sunnah. Ma'adallah, summa ma'adallah. One of Imam Malik's teacher was Rabia Turai, Imam Rabia, and because he used his intellect, he was known as Ar Rabia Turai. But he was a very learned scholar. He knew the Quran, he knew the Sunnah, but when faced with different opinions coming from earlier scholars or even from Sahaba, he and people like him used their individual reasoning as well to choose what they considered to be the stronger opinion. Now I'll talk about some of the leading companions whose views were followed in different centers of the Islamic world. And by no means is this list comprehensive. So if you don't find a name, don't think that I intentionally, uh, don't think that uh, it is not there. I'm just giving you a very short list, but you can refer to the bigger books on Islamic fit and you can find the names of a lot of other Sahaba as well. I'm just giving you the prominent names. So in Medina, we had Abdullah bin Umar no, whose student was Nafe, whose student was Imam Malik. So the Malik is sick, has a lot to do with the fiqh of Abdullah bin Umar. No. Abdullah ibn Abbas no, lived in Medina as well, but he also lived in Mecca, where Abdullah ibn Zubair was also there. And he was actually a Khalifa at that time, during the time of Yazid. And he was also a learned man. In Basra, we have Abu Musa al-Ashari and Anas bin Malik. No. In Syria, Maud ibn Jabal, Ubadah bin Sabit. Uh, Abdullah ibn Abar bin As in Egypt and Abdullah ibn Masood and Arid radiallahu ta'ala anhuma in Kufa. So there was no Islamic center that did not have the Sahaba over there, very senior Sahaba, very learned Sahaba, jurist among the Sahaba. So we cannot say, like Joseph Sack mentioned, that people in each area were simply fabricating ahadist and they were just following whatever they wanted to follow. This, that's not true, but I'm not going into these details. Now, the leaving tradition. So there is a difference of opinion between Imam Shafi, who disagreed with his teacher, Imam Malik. And when we discuss all of these ulama, we'll talk about it in more detail. Imam Shafi was, you can call a textualist. He relied upon the text. So when people were acting or were doing their practices in Medina, he asked this question from his teacher, where is the hadith? And one of Imam Malik's uh, saying is that, Thousand from thousand is better than one from one. What he meant was that a hadith narrated by one person from one person is on the one hand, and then you have thousands of people in Medina who are practicing based upon what they have seen their parents and their teachers do, who were tabayin and students of Sahaba Radwanullah, even if there is no text, what do you want me to prefer? Should I prefer 
thousand or should I prefer one written text? But there was a difference of opinion between these two scholars. So Imam Malik relied upon the living tradition of the people of Medina, which can also be called Amal Ahlul Medina. Now I want to just give one example that if we look at the Hajj of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Muslims for the last more than 14 centuries have been performing the Hajj as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam performed. The initial Muslims did not have Bukhari and Muslim and other books of Hadith or books of Fiqh. They were simply following the practice of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a living practice which was continued by generation after generation after generation. So Imam Malik used Amal of Ahlul Madinah as one of the most important principles as a source of the Fiqh al Akam al Fatawa. And the reason, there are several reasons given. Some of them are that Madinah was the first center of Islam in the sense that it was the place where Islamic State was first established. There were a large number of companions, Ridwanullah Alayhi Majmain, who lived there. They taught their students, they taught their uh, children as well and their grandchildren as well. We know that. And the followers of the companions, the Tabi'un and then Atba Tabi'un, continued the tradition. So there is a Tawatur. There is a continuity, unbroken continuity, going all the way back to the Prophet So I think this is something very important. Now, who were the leading Tabi'un after the Sahaba Ridwanullah Alayhi Majmain? And there were many, but I will only mention a few. So the most famous of them are called the Sab'a Fuqaha al Madina, the seven leading Fuqaha or jurists of Madina. And they were the largest contributors with respect to the transmission of Hadith and making of fatwas in Madina during the second century. <clears throat> and then Qursayd ibn al Musayyab, who was actually the son in law of Abu Huraira, radiallahu ta'ala, no? Urwa ibn Zubair ibn al Awwam. So Urwa was the son of uh, Zubair ibn al Awwam. Salim bin Abdullah bin Umar, he was the grandson of uh, Umar radiallahu ta'ala no, and son of Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu ta'ala no. Qasim bin Muhammad ibn Abu Bakr. So Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala no, married Asma bin Umesh, who was the wife of, uh, ja widow of Jafar radiallahu ta'ala no. And uh, she gave birth to a son Muhammad during the Hajj of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa She then married Ali radiallahu ta'ala no, after Abu Bakr Siddiq passed away. And Muhammad ibn Abu Bakr grew up in the house of Ali radiallahu ta'ala no, and his son Qasim became one of the leading fuqaha of Medina. So here you have a lineage as well. Then we have Abu Salama, who was son of Abdurrahman ibn Auf, very famous sahabi of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Suleyman ibn Yassar, Kharija ibn Zayd ibn Thabit. This is Zayd ibn Thabit's son, you know. Then there were other scholars such as uh, Abu Bakr ibn Abdurrahman ibn Harith, Ubaidullah ibn Abidullah ibn Utbah ibn Masood, then among the Tabi'in of Makkah, one of the most famous one was Atta bin Abi Rabah. He was an African-American. He was actually a slave. But because of his intellect, his honor, who was a woman, freed him and said, you know, you devote your time to his studies. And he became so knowledgeable and so learned. There is an incident reported from Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu no, that people went probably to Medina to ask him some question. He said, why did you come here to ask me? You have Atta. And it is mentioned that Atta learned from about 200 uh, Sahaba Ridwanullah alayhi majmain. And he was one of the teachers of Abu Hanif, Imam Abu Hanifa as well. Then you have Mujahid bin Jabr, uh, Abdullah bin Ubaidullah ibn Abi Malakiya, Tayyami. Taymi, sorry, Amr bin Dinar, and Ikrama, who was a mola or freed slave of Abdullah ibn Abbas. So these were one of the, some of the leading scholars in Medina who had learned not from one Sahabi, but many Sahaba Ridwanullah. And they used to give fatawa even during the time, during the lifetime of the Sahaba Ridwanullah. So the torch was passed from one generation to the next generation, and it is still burning. Now, there were also uh, Tabin in Yemen, Taus bin Kaysan, Atta bin Markabuz, Abu al-Ash'ash, Sharahil bin Sharjil al-Sal'ani, uh, Hanash bin Abdullah al-Sal'ani, Abdu, Abu Abdullah Wahab ibn Munabba. There were also uh, Fuqaha of Tabin bin Kufa, which were, who were the followers of Abdullah ibn Masood radiallahu ta'ala. No? And the most famous names are Al-Qama, Masru, and Ibrahim Nakhai. Ibrahim Nakhai is the teacher of the teacher of Imam Abu Hanifa. And he learned from Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha as well. I don't know if he 
learned from Abdullah bin Masood radiallahu ta'ala no, I don't know he was born in the year I think late 40s and he died at the end of the first century of Islam he didn't have a long life but he is considered to be like one of the grandfathers of the Hanafi fiqh now what contribution did the followers the Tabim made and I'm quoting actually from a book written by Mawzil Zidin, which is called Islamic Law. It's a very small book, but a very profound, highly intellectual, highly academic book. So he mentioned that the followers, Tabi'un Rahmahullah, were a link between the companions and the Holy Prophet They followed in the methodological footsteps of the Holy Prophet and his companions. They referred to the Holy Quran and the Sunnah. They exercised ijtihad by considering the reason behind previously made injunctions and by taking public interest into account. So those are two very important things for any mujtahid. That when you look at the decision given by earlier scholars or by the Sahaba Radhuanullah Alayhi Majmain, you should look at the reason. How, why was this fatwa given? What was the basis of this that fatwa? And they also took public interest, Maslihatun Nas, into account, which is also one of the principles of the Islamic fiqh or you can say our madam that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not made anything difficult for people. So Islamic fiqh to begin with is for the human beings by the creator of the human beings, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who wishes no hardship upon people. <clears throat> so the last part that I want to mention is this very profound statement made by Moal Zidin is that the small candle which was lit at the time of the Holy Prophet وسلم, became a torch during the era of the Orthodox Companions with the political and military expansion of Islam this pensive fire gained momentum and spread throughout the Muslim land we are actually reaping the fruit of the labor of the Prophet وسلم, his Sahaba Tabi'un, Atbaw Tabi'un the leading scholars of the four Sunni Madaib and many others. And their hard work has continued to help us in solving the day-to-day -day problems that seem to emerge with time, with geographical location, changing cultures, changing customs. So this torch has been passed from one generation to the next generation. It is still burning. It will continue to burn, inshallah. And we have to trust our scholars. If there is a consensus on an issue, it is better to follow that consensus rather than use our own intellect. Collective wisdom is always better than individual wisdom. And inshallah, then we will continue this series for one more lecture before Ramadan, which will be about the establishment of the Madahib. And thereafter, inshallah, after Ramadan, we will resume this series by looking at the life, the, at the lives of several Islamic scholars, beginning with the four Mujtahidun, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam Ashafi, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. We'll also talk about some of their famous students and some other leading personalities of Islam as we go on to learn some lessons from their life. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.